Hey. Hey, you. My name's Dr. Knott. This is Sorcery Part 2 from Steve Jackson, or based on his characters and story or whatever. And today, we've got a choice. Continue the search, or abandon Kari. And so this Spectre guy has told us, hey, we need to decide. If we leave, we're going to be cursed. If we stay, will help us out or something? Not really, but we have clues. And uh, yeah, I've thought about this. Thought about this for days. No, what? <laughs> I was trying to be dramatic. Let's continue the search. I will help you, you tell him. The wizard nods. Oh, he's a wizard now. I thank you. He raises his arm and begins the spell. The raging goblins stand like statues. You feel yourself lifting up from your body as though you have been snatched away by birdmen. As you lift into the air, you hear Lorag cry out one last piece of advice. Find the lines and find the order of the lines. Kari dwindles beneath you and you feel your body growing weaker. Whoa. We can just go wherever we need to go. All right, so we know there, uh, this is really nice, actually. Um, so let's jump in here and go to the clues. Lord Sansas is the first noble of Kari, that's nice. Here we go. Lord Theta can be found blind and begging in the ruins of the fallen quarter of the city. Ruins of the fallen quarter of the city. I think that's down here. Western slums, that's the artist quarter. Mansion Row, where's the Fallen Quarter? Here it is. Why can't we fly to this? I think it's because we haven't been there yet. So let's go to the Fallen Quarter, and we'll... Oh! Oh, this is a rewind! Oh, I thought this was where we could just go wherever we wanted to. So where do we have to go? Let's actually let's actually do this properly. We have to go to the Fallen Quarters. That's one. Lord Shiva is dead. However, there are rumors that a spirit still haunts his crypt in the Necropolis. Okay, so we have to go to the we have to go to the Fallen Quarter and the Necropolis. Okay. We're gonna jump in and out here a few times. Sorry about that. Okay, so he's one of the nobles, fine. We have half a spell line. The priest at the Shrine of Slaying might be able to help you find the spell lines to the gate. The shrine is located between the well and the docks in Lower Kari. So we only have three, we only need three more lines, right? Because we have, can we have a full line from uh, Bolrag, whatever his name is? Okay, so we have to go here, between the well and the docks in Lower Kari. So I might have to go all the way back. So this is Lower Kari. Where is the well? Here's the docks. The well and the docks. So what's going to end up happening is we're going to have to go up here. And then we're going to have to run across and go all the way down here. So let's rewind it here. All right. Night has fallen. Okay, so now we're back in now we're back in time. There are two visible inns. Night has fallen. The streets will become dangerous after dark. You should find somewhere to stay. You can continue your search for the nobles tomorrow. There are two inns visible from here, the Wayfarer's Rest and the Meat and Cleaver. There is nothing obviously different about either of them. Also, somewhere nearby is the Shrine of Slang. Where though? Sleep in an alley, Wayfarer's Rest, sit by the river which is what we did initially, sleep in the market, the Meat and Cleaver, find the Shrine, yes. If I need more stamina, I'll stay at a place. Remembering that the shrine is near the docks, you search the side streets until you see a promising looking low building. You step into the doorway of the shrine at the same time as a woman and her child are leaving. He really is a holy man, mother, the little one is saying. Lassen's lame brother answered his question and he ran off the stage. 
The mother nods and the pair leave. Interesting. The shrine is an old stone building, garishly decorated with hanging cloths and thick candles that fill the air with the smell of grease and tar. At the far end on a low platform stands a hooded figure in a white robe who is talking to the assembled crowd. Does anyone else wish to take the test of slaying the god of malice calls the priest out? Calls the priest out? It's a weird way of saying that. A murmur goes around the crowd. People are nervous, but excited. You nudge someone next to you. What is this challenge, you ask? It is the test of slaying, the woman replies in a whisper. He grants you a wish if you answer him correctly. You have to worship him, or else the question he asks is impossible. She shudders and grins. They don't call him the god of malice for nothing. Are your hearts so cold, taunts the priest? Does no one here want anything? Is no one in dire or deadly need of a god's aid? Let's do it. You raise your hand and step forward. I will take your challenge. A stranger, calls the priest with glee. Welcome him, please. The crowd whisper and murmur as you make your way to the platform. Welcome, stranger, the priest declares, helping you up. Are you ready to take the challenge, knowing full well that very few succeed? I will try. The crowd cheer your response. They know this. Slaying is not a punishing god. Or rather, slaying is a not a punishing god, but he is malicious. He does not wish for you to fail, but should you fail, he wishes you to know that it w was all your own fault. <laughs> okay. I will not fail. The crowd cheer again. I see you have spirit. Good. Let's see if we can't break you, the priest smiles. Our practice is that you may choose which question to answer, but know this. One is impossible, and the other is easy. And to answer the easy question, you must give up something you hold most dear. The crowd are watching in expectant silence. It is time for you to choose. Alright, I'll give up something. I choose the easy question. The priest nods. The price of the easy question is something you value, your very soul. To answer the question, you must agree to leave your god behind and uh, become a follower of slaying. A follower such as myself and many others in this room. So you take the adventure for a great re reward? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, sure, whatever, I don't care. I will do as you ask. Brothers and sisters, the priest declares with booming enthusiasm. We have a new convert to the god of malice. Placing a hand on your forehead, he begins an incantation. You can feel your spirit guide slipping away from you. Bye, dolphin. Sure. Oh, <laughs> you wait to see what will happen. You feel an icy touch as the spirit of slaying enters your heart, laughing. The god of malice is now your spirit guide, and he will help. But his help will always come with a cruel cost, thanks. In the distance, the gong is sounded. The priest closes his eyes and begins to rock backwards and forwards. The crowd goes quiet. All eyes are on you now. The priest's eyes flick open once more as he intones the riddle from the god. A woman with magic whom you had to free. But pray, tell me now if you can. Who was she? Uh, what? A woman with magic? Oh, that was the woman in the... No, 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 no. I don't know. Are you kidding me? I can't remember that. Shoot. I think it was the woman in the, um, that had her, the page stolen and we gave it back to her. I don't even want to know what this is going to do. You close your eyes and lift a prayer to slaying. You hear his chuckling and feel a sudden weakness in your sword arm. He has sapped your strength. But you feel some clarity of mind as well. Oh, for the love. A, F, or V? I don't know. I don't know. Aliana? I really don't know. Aliana, there is a moment's pause as the priest screws up his eyes. His eyes flick open once more. That is correct, he announces. The crowd cheer. They clearly enjoy seeing slaying defeated. Very well, the priest continues, turning to you. You ha may have one wish. What do you want? Uh, nope. Tell me the spell for the north gate. The 
priest closes his eyes and summons his god. I cannot tell you the spell in its entirety, he intones, but Mulus, the second noble, was a follower of slaying, and the line he knew was, I bid you portals open wide. The spell lines you have found are listed in the key section of your inventory. You thank him. The crowd reach out to touch your tunic as you make your way to the door. Clearly not many survive the challenge of slaying. Back on the street, it is night. Time to find somewhere to rest. Your clues have been updated. That was a lucky guess. That was a lucky guess. So we've got Lorag's tumblers to sealed deep inside. I bid you portals open wide. That's got to be the last two lines, you'd think, right? All right. So head for the docks. Now we got slaying, and I'm probably never going to pray to this guy because he makes me weaker and whatnot. Uh, let's. We have seven gold this time, so. I think we tried this before where we just, we didn't, let's go to the meat and cleaver. <laughs> I'm not going to get into a fight, I'm not going to get lose my money, any of that kind of crap that happened last time. I think it was this place too. The meat and cleaver is a small grimy place that looks like it's been converted from a wood store. Rats run across the floor and the customers at the tables look haggard and tired, as if just smelling the air is draining them. By the bar, a stooped and hunched innkeeper wipes his beer mugs with a filthy handkerchief. Ugh. Uh, let's just get a night's rest and get out of here. You go over to the table with a space. May I sit? You ask the current occupants. The man waves a hand and shifts to one side. The name's Jira, he says. I'm a musician. You're a traveler? He smiles. How have you enjoyed your day in Kari? I looked for nobles, but found none. I'm not surprised, Jira replies. You do better trying to find a shred of decency in Sansa's... In Sansa's heart. <laughs> Then find the nobles he's been running out of town. The others laugh, but one of the women shakes her head, saying softly, He's not run any out of town. If they were out, he wouldn't be able to control them. He's crippled them all instead. Jira introduces his friend with a gesture. This is Almira. She's a dancer, but don't let that fool you. She's a thoughtful soul, if ever there was one. Almira nods her head. <laughs> Greetings. Almira smiles once, then turns back to her food. Jira crunches on a battered skunk bear toe. So, he says, are you staying here tonight? Yes. He nods. You're a brave man. I don't know many who, uh, I don't know many as would risk the beds at the heated reaver, or whatever this place is called. The owner makes good rat bone fritters, but he's a few giblet short of a casserole. Where should I stay? The other end isn't bad, though I hear that Vic tends to scoop up the drunks. He nods meaningfully. Then I won't drink. A very good idea, my friend. Jira tries to lighten the tone, raising a toast with his mug. What is it? This, I'll cross the river tomorrow? What is that even? I need to find a blind beggar. You make your farewells and stand once more. Can I, like... There's, like, one bed in this place. Oh, okay, let's go to the other place and not drink. How about that? This place looks disgusting. You turn and head back out to the street. Okay. You walk back to the docks. I mean, I haven't yet, but there you go. You're running out of options. Let's go to Wayfarer's Rest. I'll spend some gold just to sleep. You make your way inside the Wayfarer's Rest. It's a lively and bustling place. The innkeeper behind the bar is trying to serve numerous creatures all demanding ale at the same time, while around the tables, salty types and buxom wenches are laughing together and singing shanties. How am I supposed to sleep around here? There's like one bed in this place too. You fight your way through the creatures to the bar. With a thump on the bar top, you catch the innkeeper's attention. Greetings, you say. Nice place you have here. The innkeeper nods at you. He's clearly impressed by your dress and fearsome aspect. And what be your purpose in these here parts, he asks. <laughs> ask the price of a room. How much is a room, you ask? The innkeeper holds up four fingers, rather than shouting across the bar. The other creatures at the bar jostle and push each other for space. Let's go. You hand over four gold pieces. For a moment, the attention of every other creature at the bar is distracted by the shine. Then the innkeeper slips the coins into his belt, and conversation resumes. He jerks, a th he jerks a thumb to the staircase in one corner. Go up whenever you like. Can I buy some food? 
Can you feed me in this hell? Why would I say it like this? <laughs> Can you feed me in this hell hole? You ask. The innkeeper nods. I. To the gills for six gold pieces, hearty as you like. It is horribly expensive and probably horrible tasting. You shake your head. A ruffian knocks over a dwarf's mug of ale. The fight that breaks out is short, sharp, and ends with the heel of an axe breaking the ruffian's nose. A great cheer goes up, and the innkeeper replaces the ale free of charge. You push your way back out the crowd, right, back out of the crowd at the bar. An angry dwarf in one corner suddenly leaps to his feet, shouting, "Enough talking, then! Let's show the council what we think of them now." So before, what we did is I headed to this table, and I got into a fight and got kicked out. <laughs> so we're not doing that this time. You head up the stairs to the room of the inn. I just want some sleep, and we're gonna cross the river. The room is small but clean. You lie down on the bed, tired from your day of walking through the busy street. Yes, let's eat something. Before settling down, you eat the last of your provisions and feel a little better for it. Then it is time to sleep. You close your eyes, and the noise from downstairs does not trouble you for long. Your dreams are cluttered and crazy. Red-eyed beings loom at you. Face after face laughs at you as you ask about the spells. Four, says one. There are eleven spells. Thirteen. Forty-nine. Meanwhile, the ghost of Lorag laughs and chortles. I have you right where I want you, he exclaims gleefully. And somewhere beneath your feet, you hear a man cackling with laughter, and the crown is on his head, beyond your reach. So I ate, and I slept, and I only gained three stamina. That sucks. Dawn breaks and you head downstairs. The inn looks like a whirlwind passed through it. Chairs are turned over on top of tables, plates and flagons have been scattered around, and several patrons are passed out asleep on the floor. Yeah, we're gonna keep walking. You, you pick your way across the bodies to the door and go out into the street. I am done dinking around. We came back in time to do what we have to do and that's it. As the sun breaks over the rooftops of Lower Kari, the city looks clean and bright, like a stone polished to a shine by a fast-flowing river. The effect lasts for a beautiful moment, and then the people of Kari begin to stir, opening their windows to throw out their slop, shouting and cursing at each other as they do so. That's deja vu. Let's head to the bridge. The market traders begin to set up their stalls, fighting and threatening each other to get the spots closest to the ships. A few sly types, probably pickpockets, begin to prowl the shadows between the stands. We're not buying breakfast. Let's go. You ignore the various food stalls and watch the river as you wait. After a while, a grizzled old man arrives and unlocks a small booth by the harbor bridge. He goes inside and closes the door behind him. So let's wait this time. We're not going to do what we did last time. You sit down outside the booth and wait for the man to lower the harbor bridge. After a while, something happens. The old man leaves his booth and goes over to a contraption on the waterfront. He begins to heave and wind an ancient winch. It seems to be quite hard work. He's trying to move the whole weight of the bridge single-handedly. Let's go help him. You get to your feet and go over to help the man out. Garoof, he howls. You'll brack it. You let the man struggle, happy to let him be stubborn. Sweat beads on his forehead, and he heaves and puffs as he works, but eventually the bridge clunks down into place. You salute the man cheerfully and get to your feet. Cool. That wasn't so bad. You cross the bridge over the ridger, <laughs> over the river Jabaji, which runs like a slime trail through the center of the city. Alright. We're not going to break the bridge this time. You have reached the banks of Upper Kari. The buildings here are not as grand as on the south side of the river, but they are in much better condition. Fewer people live on this side, away from the fields and the hills, but those that do are richer. They are also most likely more dangerous. But of course, it is on this side of the city that the North Gate stands. And of course, we read that before and we knew all that information. You follow the road away from the river, towards a fork in the road. If there are any nobles still in the city port, their houses are most likely to be on this side of the river. But which way? Oh, I can tell you. Um, okay, let's go this way. And then we're going to head south, of course. The sun is rising over the streets of Upper Kari. A few creatures roam this way and that, unaware that they are uh, they have walked these streets in just this fashion once before. In one corner, a spring bubbles with fresh water. Yes, this is fine. Drink from the fountain. Boom. Full stamina. All right, let's move on. We're going to go a little... F so we haven't gone this way before. We went up left before, so wrong way. You turn right, heading away from the city wall. The sign points towards Fireview Square. 
You pass large houses that have the aspect of official places of business. One is marked with the clawed fist of a money lender. An elven woman is just leaving. She looks quite worn out already, this early in the morning. I'm ignoring people. We know where we have to go. You pass by her as you continue down the street. She murmurs a hurried apology and races away without a second look. The alley gets wider, and passing a long building on the left which seems to be full of children, on the step a lanky man sits with his eyes firmly closed. Let's keep walking. You ignore him and keep moving. I don't want to get into trouble and get, like, off track, so we're gonna... We're kinda just gonna beeline towards where we have to be. You are back on the approach to Fireview Square. Once again, you stand in the plaza of the Red Eyes, the heart of this half of the city port. In all directions, roads lead off, some, no doubt, to the houses of nobles and others directly into danger. On the other side of the square, the main road continues on through a low arch. A thousand other alleyways lead off in all directions into Upper Kari. That's what that looks like. You look around the various exits from the square. Okay, so we need to get to the Fallen Quarter. So let's go this way. Through the arch. No, we're, we're going to leave that monument. We did that before. Not going to do that again. You choose a random alleyway on the right side of the square and slip into the shadow be between the tall buildings. The houses either side are well built and well defended. There are iron railings on the windows, and some even have arrow slits and portcullises. One householder has dug a moat around his front door. <laughs> what? Outside one building, a tall man stands with a grappling hook. Yep, we'll just keep on going. You ignore him. Such goings on are presumably quite ordinary in Kari. Along the alleyway. The street is falling into disrepair around you. Something has blighted this region of the city. Even the trees in the gardens behind the mansions have turned black where they stand. The only greenery is the moss on the stone walls. There are no rats scurrying underfoot, and only spiders roost in the rooftops. You pass a particularly grand house, its doors locked with a heavy iron chain. A mausoleum, nothing more. You continue along the street. A narrow alley opens up to your left, slipping between the buildings. Yeah, let's keep going. The buildings are thinning out. Through a gap between roofs, you can make out a tall, crooked steeple some way away, like a finger pointing up towards the heavens. A dark shape sits at its very tip. You ignore the shadow. It is probably just fallen beam. You keep walking. Alright, so this is where we have to be. Into the wasteland. Whoa. Once again, you are emerging from the alley into a wide area of wasteland. Once, this was a busy city district, but now it looks as though a hurricane has leveled it. Nothing stands higher than head height. A few staircases lead to nowhere, and in some places a door, stand, or a door still stands. Plants grow from every crevice and crack as though someone had poured green paint over the whole scene. Things are constantly moving and shuffling between the leaves. The road... The road, such as it is, is quickly smothered by piles of wreckage. There are lots of other ways to pick your way through. One possible route leads up and over the side of a broken down house. Another passes by what might have once been a mill. You would have to climb over the mill wheel to continue this way. So let me see where we have to go. Lord Theta can be found blind and begging in the ruins of the fallen city, uh, quarter of the city, okay. Blind and begging. No, I don't want to... Yeah, there you go. So let's see what we got here. The house has been sliced, like a mini-layered cake, showing the floors that were once inside. Opened rooms have been stripped of their color by the wind and light, and of their possessions by a decade or more of scavengers. There are still hints that this place was once a family home. The hooks in the ceiling above the hearth, the marks notched on a ground floor pillar that suggests the height of growing children. Who would build a mill out here so far from the river? Still, there is a gigantic mill wheel lying on its side in the path. Despite the state 
that the building next to it is in, the wheel itself seems perfectly intact and has not even lost its perfect circular shape. You clamber up the fallen rubble to the roof of the broken building. From here, you get a clear view across the rest of the wasteland. It stretches for a mile or two and will take about an hour to cross on foot. And, it, and at its far side, a tall iron fence thick with ivy slices across the land. Perhaps to keep people, keep the people of the wasteland out, or to keep whatever is beyond the fence in. In the distance, you see dark shapes moving across the sky. You make your way down the far side of the building and back onto the path beyond, which soon forks. So I, I, I still, this is not the fallen corridor quite yet. We still have to get there, I think, right? You follow the path to the right between broken foundations and cracked streets. On one side, a roof sticks half out of a sand dune. On the other, a front door lies flat on the ground as though leading to a hidden cellar. Then the path comes to a building that, amidst all this destruction, is still standing. Its door is closed, and its stone walls seem completely intact. Let's just see what happens. You try the door and find that it falls open at the slightest touch. Yeah, I, I still think the fallen quarter... I'm not sure where this guy is. It's not He's not in the wasteland. So let's keep going this way. The house consists of a single room with a large table and a large chair, and in the far corner, a sealed box. Everything seems in good repair. Wood looks waxed and polished, and the hinges on the box are free of rust. So clearly this is like a magic house or something. From the doorway, you stop and look around, and that's when you notice the foot sticking out from under the table. You go over to look at the foot. It is clawed and a dull shade of gray-green. It is about the size of your head and sticks out from under the low table. The house feels dead. Even the air inside seems not to move. <laughs> Let's prod it. <laughs> Reaching forward with your sword, you cautiously prod one toe of the foot. Nothing happens. Feeling more confident now, you prod it once more. Still nothing. It seems like this creature is either very asleep or very dead. You hang back, ha hand on your sword hilt, to see if the foot does anything. It does not move does not smell either, so whoever's foot it is, they're certainly not dead. Um. Okay, no longer concerned about the creature, you head over to the box and lift the lid. Inside are a series of small round stones carved... No, I'm not doing this, let's leave. <laughs> you step back outside into the dying sunlight. No, I want to go this way. How do I get, like... I was I was given no option. Uh, all right, let's see what happens here, and then we'll uh, make a decision. You make your way between blasted walls and weed encrusted rubble. There is constant movement in the corner of your eyes. Rats scurrying to hide under stones and in the cracks. The path turns around a large stone fountain, which has toppled over on one side, revealing an empty well shaft leading down into the earth. No, oh, I don't care about that. Follow the path around the edge of the wasteland. I've not seen a single person begging. How was I supposed to get into this area? That's annoying. After a while, another path joins this one. Looking back along it, you see a toppled steeple. A track climbs the rise at your back towards a low hovel. This is the far edge of the wasteland. Ahead, you make out a line of tall dark trees. There's a hole in the fence that gets us into the necropolis. There's a low hovel and a steeple. We know we have to get to the necropolis, but we know we have to get back here. So I'm going to probably loop around and try getting into the fallen quarter. I'm not sure if the fallen quarter is like up here or if we have to get... I'm not sure. So next time we will figure out how to get over there and then we'll loop back around and do the necropolis. So loop to the fallen quarter, loop back to the necropolis. We'll figure this out. We got one more line. So maybe in the next episode we can get another line and then again another. So thank you for watching and I'll see you then. Take care and goodbye.